Okay, Merle Goldstein here, therapist from Clifton, New Jersey. And I wrote a blog post um, last night actually on, I called it feeling stuck, your unconscious maybe trying to tell you something. And I, I'm writing about, or I wrote about in this blog post a little bit about um, some of what I've been integrating into my work as a therapist based on the work of Lacan, who is a French psychoanalyst, um, that has been studied more in academia lately than in clinical training programs, at least in the US. Um, although some people are starting to get a little bit more interested in his work here as well, you know, in terms of how it fits with or how it helps with the clinical situation or actually practically speaking when you're doing therapy, um, ways in which Lacan's ideas can inform the work. Um, and so I want to just talk a little bit about how I got interested in studying about Lacan and some of the ways that what I've learned is informing the way I work as an analyst right now. So um, actually I was taking a course, a psychoanalytic course, and one of the readings that we were assigned was a book by Annie Rogers called A Shining Affliction. And it's actually a very gripping read. It's a bit of a thought provoking in some ways um, sad or alarming kind of story. Um, although it, you know, has a good ending in which, you know, Annie Rogers was treating a child who was traumatized and got kind of triggered it from it herself. And she talks about, you know, her experience and, and, and what ended up happening. But I, I Googled her name, you know, once we were assigned this book by her, just to kind of see a little bit about the author. And I saw that more recently, she had written a book called The Unsayable. And The Unsayable was actually um, very much a book about ways in which people speak their traumas through certain um, behaviors or symptoms or um, problems that they were having that they, they, there was something they were actually showing about an earlier experience or an unresolved or unspoken experience in their lives through their acting out or through whatever it was that they were doing in their lives at that time. And she interviewed a lot of adolescents, um, some of them adolescents, you know, in a lot of pain who had trauma histories and were maybe living on the streets or um, doing things that were unsafe. And she was able to help them actually um, speak a bit of the story of their traumas that were kind of really being expressed through their problems or their symptoms or their behaviors. And she broke it down in a way that, you know, was very easy to understand. And one of the things that Annie Rogers was, was saying is that some of the other psychoanalytic techniques that she studied seem to um, kind of fall short in terms of helping people really pull out from a repetition. So um, there are ways in which we all sort of repeat certain patterns that we have, right? If we're, um, if we're afraid of abandonment or we're very sensitive to abandonment or rejection in relationships or if we're attracted to people that are very cold and critical um, or if there are certain, um, if we're addicted to drugs or there are certain behaviors that we're having trouble changing, that there's there are ways in which we try to help people with those things, right? There are many different ways, not only psychoanalytic, right? There's, um, there are skills that we can teach people. There are techniques that we help people learn for how to learn new behaviors or for, form new habits or stop engaging in behaviors that they, that are, that are harmful for them or that have negative consequences in their lives. Um, there are ways in which analysts can help people become aware of and have insight into some of their patterns or why they're drawn to certain things that seem to be causing them pain or that are maybe unconscious repetitions of earlier things that have happened in their lives or patterns they have learned about how relationships work. And sometimes we even speak of helping people have a new experience or a corrective experience in therapy, right? Where we we give them some of what they never had or we teach them a new way to be in a relationship. But part of um, 
I think what Annie Rogers was saying was missing from some of that is that the repetition seemed to still keep coming back. That if someone, for example, would um, feel like they were being abandoned at a certain point um, in relationships over and over again, that you could work with that and you could talk about it and you could have insight and you could give a new experience. But if there's something unspoken, if there's some core story that's tied up in that, that remains unsaid, the person is going to keep finding a place to repeat that story or to act out uh, their drama. That until the drama gets spoken and resolved, the person is going to keep scripting it. They might be able to stop for a little while or it may look like they're stopping or they may be able to change who is the player in the drama or what role they're playing. But the drama is not going to stop having that magnetic pull for them, that very compulsive, alluring pull until the person speaks whatever story is behind that trauma. And it doesn't even have to be a big trauma. We all have things that we repressed, things that in childhood we were either too young to think about and become conscious of, or at that time it was too threatening, right? Maybe as an adult or certain things that happened to us as a kid that, you know, it wouldn't be so terrible to face to face it or to talk about it, but maybe as a child it would have been completely overwhelming. Um, it could be things that, you know, maybe our parents wanted us to be a certain way and we we buried parts of ourselves that didn't fit in with that, didn't fit in with the expectation that other people had of us. So there's all sorts of ways in which we took parts of ourselves and we put them underground or we took experiences that we had and we did not speak them um, and we hid them from ourselves or we pushed them down so that they would sort of um, go underground and we could kind of survive in such a way and those things want to be spoken those parts of us want to express themselves and they will find disguised ways of doing it and they will find hidden ways of leaking out but the stories that um that are, that live inside of us want to be told and they are going to look for places to speak and so part of what I've learned as I've started working more in this way is that it's very important not just to analyze people's relationship patterns and their emotions and um, themes and what they're saying. And if you, you know, if someone tells you a dream, for example, you might listen for a certain narrative in the dream, a certain type of story, right? Maybe the person is very afraid or the person is working through a conflict between something they want to do and something they don't want to do, or the person is um, running away from something, or the person is desiring something. There's all sorts of things that we could learn from our dreams or from things we speak of in analysis or connections we make. But one of the things that I, that I learned um, really from one of my teachers who's been helping me learn more about working in this um, Lacanian way is that it's the words that people use that have a lot of, um, that hold a lot of information about the stuff in the unconscious that, that needs to be spoken. And that people have their own, each person has their own language and the, their own meanings that get loaded into certain words that have to be unpacked. And you can't really know what things mean for people until they speak them. That until you hear people's associations to certain words and um, what people say and what they don't say and what they say over and over again and um, what's missing from their speech and what changes in their speech and the way in which they use certain words, until you really help the person to, um, to speak it out, you can't really know what things mean for them. And so everyone's journey is totally individual. There's no way for someone to say ahead of time, oh, um, you're having issues with food. It must be that this technique is going to help you or it must be because, um, you know, you developed poor habits growing up or, 
uh, your mother was too focused on it and now you're rebelling against that, right? We could have all sorts of explanations, but unless we hear the person's words, we don't know what it means for them. And we they may think they know what it means, but when we start to hear what they say, then the words start to leak out, right? There's Freudian slips. There are words that come out in ways that people don't intend. There are words that people keep coming back to over and over again, Um and those are the clues. Those are the things that we can start to ask people about. You know, you keep speaking of um, fire, for example, fiery feelings inside of you or, um, you know, fires that you were afraid of or putting out other people's fires, right? You keep speaking of fire. What is fire for you? Um, and how is it that fire became the word that you use for all this, right? We can say things like that to people. We can say, you keep speaking of um, money, <laughs> money, having enough money, not having enough money, right? What is money for you? What does this mean? What does money connect to, right? Maybe it's actually not about money at all. It's about something else. And we can all make guesses, right? I mean, money is something we all project things, you know, onto it. So money could represent a million things. But until we hear what it represents for that person, we're not listening to their own specific language. And it's only when you really help people hear um, or learn their own language when, when they learn to really listen to the language of their own unconscious, then the pieces all start to come together, right? Then the pieces connect then the repetitions can be um, loosened up. People can free themselves from it. It's not an easy process, right? It's, it's hard to um, come to grips with the stuff that we know inside that maybe we haven't wanted to admit to ourselves or losses we've had that maybe we don't want to um, let go of, fantasies or illusions that we have, ideas we have about ways in which we can um, be made whole, things that we hide from ourselves. These are very painful things for people to confront really in any treatment or any psychoanalytic treatment. Um, but, there, but there are ways in which we can help people really hear um, hear what it is they're saying and learn to have a, a completely radically different type of relationship to their unconscious and to the way in which they relate to their mind um, and, and unpack their dreams and, and become aware of what things mean for them that nobody really could have told them it means that because it's only, it's only their own speech that tells us that that's what it means for them. So this is something that has, you know, been very, very interesting for me, very transformative. It's taken me into deeper places with many of my clients, some who who I had been seeing for quite some time before that. Um, of course, it's not to negate other ways of working, which I continue to use uh, when, you know, when I help people. And um, of course, there are certain things in therapy that are very healing that have nothing to do with people's language, right? Things like the support and the lack of judgment from the therapist and the um, ability to look at something in a new way and speak of things to someone else who um, maybe has a different vantage point or could pull certain pieces together for you. There are many, many ways in which we help people. We help people have a new attachment relationship, right, with someone who's safe and responsive and doesn't reject them or push them away. But I still find that... Um, that when we when we start to really listen to people's speech, uh, we can really help people come into contact with with deeper layers of the self that can be pretty hard to access. Um, so I've just I've just found that very exciting, and um, it's it's really a pleasure to work with people in that way because you get to hear people's stories, you get to learn um, a whole lot about ways in which people. Um, play out certain stories or tell themselves certain narratives about themselves, ways in which people use certain um, ways of speaking, phrases and language to, um, to tell us stories that are really quite um, obscure at first. And then we get to kind of help people speak things that, you know, we're really only able to be 
experienced in a very unspoken, experiential kind of way before that. And of course, they can never, um, they can never express what they experienced 100% in speech. We never can. But people can use speech to start to play with their experiences and work with them in a new way and to um, begin to to do something very different with the way they organize their their new experiences and, and things that maybe they were very blocked from for a very long time. People suddenly get free. They really get set free. And that is a very, very, very um, exciting and empowering thing to watch when people suddenly are able to reach their goals and uh, find love and follow their dreams and go back for a second career and um, stop criticizing themselves all the time and set boundaries and relationships that used to be very enmeshed for them, right? When you see people really making those changes that they've wanted to make for such a long time, it really, um, it feels like it's all, it was all worth it. Even if there was some pain in the middle of the process, it really feels like a very beautiful thing to kind of watch that transformation and watch people really get set free. Um, if you have any questions or you want to make any comments on some of these ideas that I'm sharing, feel free to get in touch with me. I always love to hear from people. My email address is merlegoldstein at gmail.com. All right. Bye for now.